Welcome to the final lectures for EE 111. Uh, we are going to burn through chapters six and seven in these lectures. One thing to note, we are kind of making the transition to what you're going to learn in the uh, follow-up classes uh, to this class. And so part of, uh, part of chapter six, the mutual inductance in chapter six, you're going to learn in the next class. And you're going to, you're going to get uh, chapter seven in a little bit more detail in the next class as well. And then chapters eight and nine are just completely covered by the follow follow up coursework to this one. So we are going to move through two chapters in this video. This is the last video that we're going to have in EE 111. So uh, once you get through this video, you are done. And more importantly, once I get through this video, I'm done. So I'm doing a special, it's a Scotch o'clock, <laughs> special Scotch o'clock edition. It's the end of the quarter. We have earned it. We have all earned it. So pull up your fa favorite, uh, I don't know, your favorite Mountain Dew or, uh, or Kool-Aid jammers or whatever, whatever your favorite beverage is. And let's enjoy our last video together. It has been great. And I hope to never do this over video again. So, um, so we're gonna go through chapter six and seven and it's really kind of a light topical coverage and not trying to be too brutal with the homework problems. You know, if you, if you get asked test questions on this, again, not trying to be too brutal, trying to make sure that just kind of we set the table for these basic concepts, keeping in mind that you're gonna get a lot more of these later on in the follow-up class to this. So the exciting thing about chapter six is we get into capacitors and inductors. And so, so far we've basically talked about resistors, 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 current supplies, voltage supplies, and then chapter five, we added op amps. We finally got to add another, another thing. And now in chapter six, now we're off to the races. We're adding more circuit elements. So now we're adding capacitors and, and inductors. So also keep in mind that we rely heavily on the assumption that your physics class taught you about capacitors and inductors. I have found though historically that's a bad assumption. So if you didn't get a background knowledge of inductors and capacitors in physics, it might be a good idea, you know, and we've had a lot of times it's students take this winter quarter and there's closures or snow closures or they didn't quite have enough time to get to it or something or another. I've noticed a lot of times people don't get to the, the electrostatics of capacitors and things like that. So if not, it's, you know, you should get that physics coverage, but you know, we, we can't, this class can't be just fully reteaching physics and, the, and then teaching the, the circuit material. So hopefully, hopefully you got this background, but if you didn't, maybe go back and, and uh, browse through the physics textbook. We're gonna cover a little bit of it though, but we're gonna go through it kind of quickly. So a capacitor, a capacitor, the, you know, the basic geometry of it is you have these kind of parallel plates. So the idea is you have two plates that they are physically isolated, but what happens is as current flows through a capacitor, as current flows through a capacitor, you start to get this accumulation of charges on each side of the plates. And just this concept alone is something that throws a lot of students off. Because a lot of students, the fact that a capacitor has a gap in between these two metal plates, a lot of students think, well, you can't have a current flow through it. If there's a gap between the plates, there's not really a current flow. Well, there is a current flow because if you have accumulation of one type of charge on one side and accumulation of another type of charge on another, you literally do have the same net flow of current all the way through the component. So even though you don't actually have any charges jumping this gap between the two plates of the capacitor, you do still have a current flowing through this capacitor. But what happens is as this current flows through this capacitor, you get this increasing accumulation of charges. And the capacitor equation to go to something you should have learned in physics, the capacitor equation, capacitance is, the biggest thing is capacitor, capacitance is proportional to the area of these parallel plates. And it's inversely proportional to the distance between the two plates. And then we have these uh, coefficients of permittivity of free space and uh, uh, relative permittivity. These are sort of used to, to you know, give the, these are, these are, a fundamental constant of the universe and then a, and then a ratio of, of the particular permittivity of the material that you have in this gap relative to the permittivity of free space. So 
Um, but the biggest thing for this class purpose, the biggest thing to keep in mind is capacitance is proportional to cross-sectional area, inversely proportional to the distance between the two parallel plates. And the other thing is capacitance tells you basically how many charges you will have accumulate on these plates per unit voltage. So, so a higher capacitance means it can hold more accumulated charges per volt applied across the terminals. And the equation that relates um, current and voltage is the current to a capacitor is equal to the capacitance times the derivative of the voltage with respect to time. So basically the bigger the current flowing through the capacitor, the faster the rate of change of the voltage across the capacitor. And that makes sense. When you think about the current as, as the current flows, those charges accumulate on the plates of the capacitor. Of course, the, the faster the current, the, the larger the current, the faster that voltage is going to change across the capacitor. But the biggest thing here is that rather than having the, rather than having this be a nice clean linear function, we now have a differential function. So the relationship between voltage and current for a capacitor is dictated by a differential equation. And let's put this in a different format. Well, if we want to say voltage equals something times current, in the case of a capacitor, voltage is one over the capacitance times the integral of current, plus the constant being the initial voltage across the capacitor from where you started that integration at time t zero. And again, this makes sense too, that that if you integrate that current over time, that's going to tell you the integral of current is what? It's charge. The integral of current is this charge, which, so integrating the current tells you the total charge that's accumulated on those capacitors. And then dividing that by the capacitance, as seen here, is going to give you the, the voltage across that expression. So, and that's just swapping this capacitance and voltage. We get V is equal to Q over C. All right, so that's a, that's a capacitor. And hopefully this is all review, but if not, there it is again. So a couple things to note about capacitors. What happens when we put two capacitors in parallel? So, so just like with resistors, we wanted to consider with resistors, what happens when we combine resistors in series and parallel? We wanted to be able to do the same thing with capacitors. So if we put two capacitors in parallel like this, what are we doing? Let's, you know, so let's say we have these two capacitors in parallel. Two identical capacitors now. If we put two identical capacitors in parallel, it's basically like we have doubled the cross-sectional area. So we have a certain cross-sectional area here with the same gap, same gap, and by putting two of these capacitors in parallel, it's effectively like we've just doubled the area of a single capacitor. And that is, in fact, mathematically what, what happens too. We've, we have effectively doubled the area. So when we have, if we have two identical capacitors in parallel, their capacitance, their equivalent capacitance is going to be double. And let's think about another case. If we have two capacitors in series, if we have two capacitors in series, well, it's basically like we have a double width, right? We have sort of these two gaps. It's basically like we've doubled the gap in this capacitor, and then we've just put a chunk of metal. This chunk of metal floating in the middle doesn't do anything meaningful. But we have, because we have this sort of double gap here, we have essentially doubled this distance here, which means that we would think that it would reduce our capacitance. And in fact, that's what happens when you put capacitors, if you put two identical capacitors in series, the equivalent capacitance is half of the capacitance of one of those capacitors. And it's interesting because when it comes to capacitors, this behavior of two identical capacitors in parallel is double the capacitance and two identical capacitors in series is half the capacitance. This is the inverse of what we see with resistors. With resistors, resistors in series add, resistors in parallel, we add the inverse and take the inverse of that, which as you've seen in doing homework assignments and watching these videos and everything, you know that means that if you have identical resistors, resistors in series double and resistors in parallel are reduced by half. The opposite is true with capacitors. So when we are combining capacitors in series and parallel, we have to be very careful to do the opposite of what we do with resistors. And this is probably what throws students off the most. The biggest thing that, um, you know, probably on the final, there will be a question that is, you know, combine these, resist combine these capacitors, you know, into an equivalent capacitance. And the biggest issue students have is they, even if they know 
even if they know, okay, these capacitors in, in parallel, I have to treat them like resistors in series, in series I have to treat them like resistors in parallel. Students still, you know, they get once they get their circuit reduced and they are almost finished, that's that last that last step. They always mess up. They always mess up the the uh, the very right at the right at the end. They're almost done. They get to the last combination and that's it. So. I apologize. I have hiccups. People are going to think I'm like a I'm like a cartoon character drinking here. I got these hiccups, but it's just it's just hiccups. But I am drinking. But it's just hiccups. So um, YouTube makes me say whether or not a video is for kids whenever I post it, and I always say it's not for kids. But I think I think you really have to say it's not for kids when you're drinking apple juice. When you're drinking apple juice. Okay, so. So let's do an example, combining capacitors in series and parallel. So one thing to note, the units of capacitance are farads, and maybe, maybe, hopefully that's something you remember from physics class. And one thing to note is, is one farad of capacitance a lot or a little? One farad of capacitance is a lot of capacitance. So in practice, if you were to find, if you were to stumble across a one farad capacitor, that is likely to be a very big boy. Um, I don't know, it's been a while since I did car audio stuff. That was sort of my, more my teenage years. But when I was a teenager, a one farad capacitor was, you know, something like this. It was a pretty beefy, pretty beefy construct. Um, it's big, one farad is gonna be bigger than the capacitances you tend to deal with. So if you're, if you're doing electronics in, in the curriculum in our program, you're much more likely to find capacitances on the order of microfarads or nanofarads. So mic microfarads, nanofarads, millifarad capacitors, those would even be fairly decent size. Um, you know, they're not gonna be, you know, the size of an eraser head. They're gonna be more like the size of a, the mil and then once you get to the millifarad range, you're talking more like the size, you know, the size of a gumdrop or, or bigger, so. Gumdrop, I don't even know if gumdrop's a candy, maybe, maybe just for, Gingerbread houses. Anyway, all right. So let's let's simplify this circuit. We have a circuit combination of, of capacitors. Let's combine them. So if we're looking at this, what do we have? Do we have anything in series or parallel? We have one thing in series that I see. We have these capacitors in series. So you look at this and you say, it's an 80 and a 20 in series. That's a 100. No, these are capacitors. An 80 and a 20 in series with capacitors are not going to add. It's very enticing to add these together because they add up to a nice clean 100, but that would be wrong. So if we want to combine these, we have to do 1 over 80 plus 1 over 20. The old trusty HP here. Sixteen. So these equal 16, and so there's that six, 16 here, and that is in parallel with this 14. So that equivalent is gonna be in parallel with the 14, but parallel we add. So we can say 16 plus 14 equals 30 millifarads. So now we have, just a, yeah. Yeah, it's gone, that's gone, yeah, and this is a 30, all right, see what I did there? 30 millifarads, okay, now what do we got? Now that 30 is in series with this 60, right? So all capacitors in series, we have the inverse, so one over 30 plus one over 60. It's gonna be 20, right? Oh man, now I now I don't trust myself. As soon as I'm pretty sure. Pretty sure Scotch o'clock is not a good combination. It's 20. All right, so it's 20. So we got the now we have whoop, all of this is an equivalent 20. That 20 is in parallel with the 10. So that 20 being in parallel with the 10. That's 30 millifarads. So now we have whoop, 
all, all of this goes away and this equivalent is going to be a 30. And now this is always where people make the mistake. If this, if this problem were given on a test, I guarantee you 10% of the students who did this problem would get to this point where they had a 30 and a 30 and they would say, ah, it's 60. And they would write 30 plus 30 equals 60. And then if I'm grading this, I go minus eight or something, I don't know, whatever, you know. So it's always, you, students do it. It's always right at the end, I, I guarantee. It. And even you, you're, you're watching this right now, I'm warning you, the very last stage of your capacitor combination, you will make a mistake. You will accidentally do it the wrong way. You'll treat it like a resistor instead of the opposite of a resistor. I can tell you this point blank, it's what you're gonna do. And it's still gonna be 10% of people make the mistake. I think it's just, there's no, there's something just very human about making this mistake. And, and so maybe, maybe if you don't make the mistake, there's something wrong with you. Maybe that's, maybe that's what's going on. Anyway, students make this mistake. It's always the last step. You get excited, you're like, okay, it's clean. I'm at the end, it's clean, I'm done. It's 60, nope. It's one over 30 plus one over 30. that is going to be 15. Oops. 15 millifarads. Boom. Okay. Okay. So that's combining capacitors. Biggest thing, you got to treat them the opposite of resistors. Inductors. So inductors are a coil of wire, right? You take a wire, you make a coil out of it, boop, you got yourself an inductor. So an inductor is basically a, the coil, making a coil out of this causes an acceleration of electrons, right? Because if you make electrons swirl in a circle, that is an acceleration. Remember, acceleration is a change in direction, not necessarily a change in velocity. So you create this acceleration of electrons, which creates a magnetic field. Uh, that magnetic flux sort of runs through this coil of wire. And the neat thing is when you generate this magnetic field, if you then stop, if you sort of turn this thing off, as this magnetic field collapses, it, it can do work. So, so basically as, this, as this, this, this magnetic field that you build up inside of an inductor, um, when, you, you know, turn, when you stop energizing the inductor, basically, the collapse of this magnetic field results in a changing magnetic flux, which induces current, which is useful for doing work. It's a very neat device, very simple, very simple con construction, very powerful tool though. An inductor, the inductance is a function of the square of the number of turns. So this is the, the number of rotations of your wire. It's proportional to the cross-sectional area of this wire. It's inversely proportional to the length of the wire, and it's proportional to the permeability of free space times the, the permeability ratio. So the overall permeability being the, the uh, uh, relative permeability times the permeability of free space. And again, should be physics, but who knows. So in the case of an inductor, the voltage across an inductor is the inductance times the derivative of the current with respect to time. So it's basically the faster this current is through the inductor is, or sorry, you apply it, the larger voltage you apply to this inductor, the faster the current can, through it's gonna change. So with an inductor, when you apply a voltage to it, it, it doesn't immediately have a current. Basically the current starts to accumulate as you, the, you, know, as you apply this voltage. And the larger the voltage, the faster that current is going to accumulate. And again, though, that current, that current is proportional to this magnetic field that's produced. And this magnetic field that's produced has stored energy because as the field collapses, it's useful for doing work. So, so we can write the relationship between voltage and current as the voltage across an inductor is equal to the inductance times the derivative of the current. And if we wanna write an expression for current, we can say the current through an inductor is one over the inductance times this integral of voltage plus the initial current that was going through the inductor. So just like with 
Kirchhoff's current law, Kirchhoff's voltage law, just like with current and voltage, capacitors and inductors are kind of complements of one another. So we have very similar equations here for the capacitor, but we are switching now where there was a current term for a capacitor, there's now a uh, voltage term for the inductor. Where there was a voltage term for the capacitor, there's a current term for the inductor. So they're just complements of one another. And one of the biggest things to note with an inductor is, and I should, I, I gotta go back actually. For the capacitor, looking at this equation, is it possible for the voltage across an inductor uh, capacitor to change instantaneously? So can the voltage across, a, say you flip a switch or you, you know, connect a capacitor to a battery or something, is it possible for the voltage across a capacitor to change instantaneously? No, because an instantaneous change in voltage would be an infinite derivative, which would require an infinite current. So unless you have, an, unless you have a source of an infinite current, the voltage across a capacitor cannot change instantaneously. With an inductor, unless you have an infinite voltage, the current cannot change instantaneously. So it's important to note, the current through an inductor cannot change instantaneously. And the voltage across a capacitor cannot change instantaneously. Okay, now the nice thing about inductors is inductors, unlike capacitors, inductors combine just like resistors. So I don't have a separate slide belaboring this point. I just say, and inductors, most students are, are better with inductors than they are with, with uh, capacitors for this very reason. That an inductor, you treat it like a resistor, and you know what, it even sort of looks like a resistor, right? I mean, it's kind of a, kind of loopy swoopies instead of spiky swoopies, but it still, it still looks like a resistor even, so unlike capacitors. So, so we combine these just like we do resistors. Let's do it. 21, 19, that's 40. 40 in parallel with a 40, that's 20. We're doing turbo mode here. So this thing now, 20. 20 in series with a 10, that's a 30. We wipe all this out, we get a 30. 30 in parallel with a 60, we know what that is. That's a 20, right? 20 in series with a 10, that's a 30. 30 in parallel with a 45. <laughs> it was all going so well until then. So 30, <laughs> 30 in parallel with 45, that one slows us down. All right, all right. 18, of course. And then 18 in series with a seven, 25. And the units of inductance are Henry's. So is a one Henry inductor a big inductor? You bet it is, that thing is huge. A one Henry inductor is, that's a massive inductance. Um, just like with capacitors, you know, the unit, it's, it's, it's very rare to see one of them. A one Henry inductor is a very large inductor. It's very hefty, it's gonna weigh, it's gonna weigh a lot. It's gonna be, you know, the size of a baseball. Um, now the one thing with inductors, you know, with capacitors, you can get a big capacitance that's only rated to a small voltage and same with inductors. It's very easy to get a big inductance that's rated to a very small current. So, so when I say, oh, a one, a one Henry inductor is gonna be enormous. Well, you might have a one Henry inductor that can only handle 10 milliamps of current and that actually might be kind of small. So nothing is for sure. Okay, so hopefully that was fairly straightforward. Now, the cool thing about these, this is different than, the, you know, one of the biggest things that set these apart from resistors, other than the fact that it's a differential equation that defines the relationship between voltage and current is, these are energy storage elements. Resistors could not store energy. A resistor was basically just, you know, it just dissipates energy and that's all it can do. That's all it can do. And an, an inductor and a capacitor though, they can both store energy. And we can at any moment in time, determine how much energy is stored in that inductor or capacitor using these simple equations. The energy stored in an inductor is, or sorry, the energy stored in a capacitor is one half CV squared. Of course, anytime you see a one half and something squared, you probably from calculus know where that comes from. We don't go through the derivation of this, the book does. So if you wanna, if you wanna go through chapters six and seven in slow mode, you can do that. Um, you can do that if you want. The, the, book, the book does it that way. 
I'm going to skip it because you've probably seen it in physics or you don't care. So, um, And in the case of an inductor, the inductor, the energy stored is one half L I squared. So at any moment, any moment in a circuit, as long as we know the current flowing through an inductor, we can find the energy stored in the inductor. And at any moment, if we know the voltage across a capacitor, boom, we know the energy stored in that capacitor. That's chapter six. That was it. That was quick. We got one. Oh, man. Scotch clock. So we can find that. That's the quick rundown. The probably should have seen that stuff in physics. Uh, chapter six evaluation. Now on to chapter seven. Uh, one of the things we skipped in chapter six, I just skipped over mutual inductance. Uh, mutual inductance is not a concept that has as much meaning until you get to the later evaluations of these circuits where you're using the Laplace transform. So, um, so I'm, I'm, I don't like to, I don't like to spend too much time on it. It's a good concept. It's a, it's a critical concept to understand, but it's okay if it waits until you're dealing with the, the S domain analysis of, uh, of these circuits. So you'll see that it's, it's coming up. Chapter seven though. Chapter seven is an important chapter. It's important to be able to do the analysis in chapter seven. Why? If for no other reason, these sorts of problems show up a lot on the FE exam. So the FE exam, I've talked about it in this video series, the Fundamentals of Engineering exam. It's the exam you take after you're done with college, uh, before you become a professional engineer. It's the first step to becoming a professional engineer. I mean, other than getting a degree, but um, it's, it's, it's the test you take to say, yes, I got a degree. Yes, the degree was meaningful. And then you work for a few years under a professional engineer and you take another test and then you're a professional engineer and then you get to pay a bunch of taxes because you're practicing as a professional engineer in your state. And anyway, that's a totally different, that's a totally different story. So, um, but these types of questions for some reason are all over that FE exam. I don't know why they like these chapter seven style questions, but they love them. I don't even know how practical they are, how often they come up in, in real life situations. I mean, the concepts are really critical for real life situations, but the analysis is, I don't know how often it's, it's done as a you know, practicing professionals. I'm not sure how often they're doing these types of things. What is chapter seven? Chapter seven is looking at first order RL and RC circuits. So this is basically, let's, let's not just take capacitors and just treat a circuit as just pure capacitors. Let's not just take inductors and treat them as a circuit of pure inductors. Let's look at a circuit that blends inductors and capacitors and a circuit that blends, uh, sorry, that blends inductors and resistors and a circuit that blends capacitors and resistors. And these end up being because the equations for an inductor and the equations for a capacitor are differential equations. Circuits that involve resistors and inductors or resistors and capacitors end up having equations that are first order differential equations. And to solve them, you have to solve a first order differential equation. And I mean, most of you did differential equations. You can do all these. You can drive all of these from scratch. I actually don't go through the derivation from scratch because I'm trying to keep this quick. If you want to go through the book, the book will do it, or you can even just intuit it yourself. You can use the equations that we talked about in chapter six. You can use, you know, this expression and, oh, oh here we go. What's happening now? And, oops, this expression, and you can, Go through the analysis yourself with differential equations and that's fine. And that's good to be able to do. And there might even be some homework problems that have you do that. I'm skipping it though. We're gonna skip it for now. Um, okay, so, but what we're looking at in this chapter is basically how do inductors play along with resistors in circuits and how do capacitors play along with circuit with resistors in circuits? And, and one thing to keep in mind is that, oh, sorry, my eyes are, time of year, my allergies just start killing me. Um, and this time of year, basically, these, uh, gosh, in these types of circuits, one of the things to note is inductors and capacitors are energy storage elements, which means they can charge up a stored energy and discharge a stored energy. And this, this notion of they are charging and discharging a stored energy means they don't do things instantaneously. It means unless you, you can't transfer infinite power, right? You don't have circuit elements that can transfer infinite power, you know, especially you have a current supply through, through a resistor or, or voltage supply through a resistor, current supply in parallel with a resistor. These things are not capable of delivering infinite power. 
And because you can't deliver infinite power, you cannot have an instantaneous change in energy, which means you have to have some transition over time where the energy stored changes. And as that transition happens over time, you're gonna have all of your voltages and currents in your circuit are gonna kind of transition from one state to another. And chapter seven is all about if we have these circuits which have transitions and the transitions in this, in this class are always represented by a switch flip. When you have a transition in a circuit that has an energy storage element like a capacitor or an inductor, how do you, how do you describe the equation that shows how these currents and voltages in the circuit change following this switch flip events. Following this change in the state of the circuit, how do you describe these transients? And again, you're, you're effectively describing the solution to a differential equation, which means the form of this should be fairly similar to the form of solutions to first order differential equations you've seen in the past, and they will be, but we're just gonna talk about them a little more generically for right now. And we're gonna sort of just use the solved equation when we're doing this analysis. Okay, so, so there's going to be basically for these circuits, there's gonna sort of be an initial state to the system, then the switch flips, and then there's a final state to the system. And there's some transition that happened in the middle at a certain rate. So our challenge in chapter seven is find the initial values, find the final values, find the transition rate. So, if you go through the book, the book basically splits up these sorts of problems into two distinct types of, of, of solutions. They do this sort of natural response and the step response. And the only difference between a natural response and a step response is a natural response is a response that dies down to zero. So a natural response is basically if you had an energy storage element and you switch the state of the system so that it loses all of its energy as time goes to infinity, that's a natural response. It's basically saying everything dies to zero. A step response is when your system starts at an initial value and then it transitions to a final value, which is something other than zero. So a step response is just when, you're, when you're, your unknown variable at time infinity, after your switching event, your unknown variable goes to something other than zero. Natural response, it goes to zero. Step response, it goes to something other than zero. But actually, we don't need to really consider these as two separate things. We can look at all of the system responses in chapter seven as just a transition from one value to another. So all of these circuits, I prefer to just say, you have to find an initial value, you have to find a final value, and you're gonna find the transition from one to the other. And you know what? The initial value could be zero. The final value could be zero. Who knows? Um, but if there's zeros, whatever, you're just going to plug a zero into your equation and it's going to get a lot simpler. So I, I tend to prefer that over what the book does, which is let's have multiple different equations and let's treat them as totally different cases. I just say, let's treat it as one case. We have a system. It has a switch. The moment we flip a switch, the system has certain values in it. It's got certain voltages and certain currents. And then when time goes to infinity, it's got some other voltages and currents and there was some rate of change from that initial state to the final state and beyond that we don't care the initial value could be five volts the final value could be 20 volts the initial value could be zero amps the final value could be 10 amps so the initial value could be 20 amps the final value could be five amps it doesn't matter to me my my biggest thing is i think it's easier to look at these as just doing these problems is just finding the initial value, finding the final value, finding the rate at which the transition occurs. So the initial value, be it a voltage or a current, the final value, and then the transition rate, which we call a time constant. Okay, how do we find these initial values and final values? So, so we have a circuit and, a, and it's, it's in a certain state and the, you know, we have a, a certain current through our inductors, certain voltage across our capacitors, certain voltage across our resistors, certain current through our resistors. And then we flip a switch and when we flip the switch, the circuit changes. A, a switch flip is basically just a way of, of saying we had one structure of a circuit and now we have a new structure of a circuit. And that new structure of a circuit is gonna have different currents and voltages. Well, to analyze these, we consider this sort of steady state condition. So the steady state condition is when everything in the circuit has settled down, when things aren't wiggling anymore, when, when things aren't transitioning, they're not growing, they're not charging, they're not discharging, everything is, at its, everything is settled down, everything is, is at its sort of steady state value, you know, it's at its, at its 
final resting place, that's steady state. And, and a lot of times these circuits are gonna have multiple steady states. So there's gonna be a steady state before the switch is flipped and then we flip the switch and then everything's unsteady. And then after a certain, after a long time, we have a new steady state based on the new switch flip. So when analyzing the, be, the, the behavior of a circuit, when analyzing the voltages and currents in a circuit at steady state, it's interesting to note that at steady state capacitors are open circuit and inductors are short circuit. And it's, it's kind of easy to remember this because remember a capacitor, a parallel plate capacitor is literally two plates with a gap in between. So yeah, there's a current flow through a capacitor while things are changing, while the voltage is changing, there's a current flow. But when everything is stopped, when there's no change in voltage, the current through a capacitor is zero. So at steady state, when nothing's changing, current's zero. Open circuit. Capacitors in steady state are open circuits. And inductors, inductors are a coil of wire, but they're still a wire. So the coil of wire only really matters when things are still wiggling. When, when at steady state, when nothing's wiggling anymore, an inductor is just a wire. It's just a short circuit. So another thing to keep in mind. Okay, so in, so in the steady state assumption is capacitors and open, cir open circuit, inductors are short circuit. We analyze the circuit based on that. It's very similar to what we did with, with uh, like superposition or, or finding the uh, Thevenin resistance. It's we are replacing our capacitors with open circuits and replacing our inductors with short circuits and then seeing how, seeing where the cards fall in our circuit. The other thing to keep in mind is that the voltage across capacitors cannot change instantaneously and the current through inductors cannot change instantaneously. So basically if we have a certain voltage across capacitor right before we flip a switch, right after we flip a switch, we're gonna have the exact same voltage across the capacitor. And if we have a certain inductor, is there a certain current through an inductor right before we flip a switch, right after we flip a switch, we have the exact same current through the inductor. And that's very important to keep in mind because after we flip a switch, the circuit might have a drastically different structure, right? After we flip a switch, there could be, all of a sudden we could have instantly resistors in different places and things like that. But the things that will not change are the voltage across those capacitors and the current through those inductors, or they won't change instantaneously. So even though the circuit changed its structure, right after we make that switch flip, those voltages across the capacitors and currents through the inductors, they are gonna stay, they're gonna still be the same way they were right before the switch. So how do we find the solution to first order RL and RC circuit? So like, like what I prefer in circuit analysis in, in other sections, like in chapter four, the good thing is we can follow a process for this. And this process works for essentially any circuit, any first order circuit. First order circuit meaning it has one inductor, one capacitor, you know, one inductor or one capacitor. If it has an inductor and a capacitor, it's a second order circuit and we're not gonna talk about that in this class. But for first order analysis, one inductor, one capacitor, collection of resistors, we got a switch flipping. We have a process we can follow. And the first step is, to find the steady state, find the state of the circuit before the switch flips. So let's assume the switch is in its original position. Let's assume the circuit has been settled for a very long time. And then let's analyze what are the, uh, in particular, we wanna find what are the currents through our inductors and what are the voltages across our capacitors. That's the main thing we wanna solve for in the before the switch flip steady state. Because those currents through the inductors and voltages across the capacitors, those are the things that stay the same after the switch flip. So the next step is we solve for unknown parameters immediately after the switch flip. So after the switch flip happens, the circuit changes configurations. We basically have a totally new circuit after the switch flips. But what stays the same is of course, current and voltage supplies are still current and voltage supplies. But what also stays the same is the voltage across those capacitors and the current through those inductors. And then the last thing is we say, all right, let's say after the switch flips, our circuit has been settled for a very long time. Our circuit has been, has allowed to, to you know, settle on its final resting place, a steady state analysis. Steady state analysis, again, meaning that our current, our inductors are short circuits and our capacitors are open circuits. We say in the, after the switch flip configuration, what are our parameters, our unknown parameters after time goes to infinity, after everything's settled down, after everything is stable and nothing's wiggling anymore, 
all capacitors are open circuit, all inductors are short circuit. So we solve it again for the after the switch flip condition. And then this, this process that we follow gives us two of our most critical values. It gives us that initial value for our unknown right after the switch flip, which was our stage step two. And it gives us our final value as time goes to infinity, which was our step three. Okay, um, and then the, the, the last step, which is not included here, we'll talk about it later, is we find sort of how quickly that transition occurs. So let's do some examples though. Before we get too far, we've, I've talked a long time without doing much examples. So let's look at this circuit and let's, let's do this analysis here. So before this switch flips, before the switch flips, we have a connection here. And when we have a connection here, what's going on in this circuit? So, so in particular, what's going on in the circuit after it's been allowed to settle to steady state? So one thing we note is when this is settled to steady state, the inductor is a short circuit. So let's consider this circuit. We have a 20 amp supply and that 20 amp supply is flowing through. We have a 0.1 ohm resistor. We got all this junk over here, but we have a short here. So because we're looking at this in the case where everything is settled, we're looking at the pre-switch flip steady state condition, inductor is a short circuit, we have basically 20 amps flowing through this short circuit here. So this IL for T I, I like to say the negative side of zero, right? T T is equal to zero, but it's the you know T is equal zero is you know the negative side of zero. It's it's right, but if a switch event happens on time zero then the negative zero time is that instantaneous moment before the switch flip. So the, current through, so the current through the inductor right at this instant before the switch flips is going to be 20 amps. All 20 amps here is flowing through this inductor. Um, and okay, so that's the current through the inductor before the switch flip. And then what about after the switch flip? Well, after the switch flip, after the switch flip, when this switch is open, what are we left with? We have one wire connecting these two sides of the circuit. And you know, when we have one wire connecting a circuit, they're isolated from each other, right? No current can flow through this wire if there's only one wire connecting because there's no way to complete the loop. So we essentially have two isolated circuits. So now all we care about is the circuit on the right side over here. And what do we know about this circuit on the right side? We know that before we flip that switch, this current through the inductor was 20 amps. And that means that the moment after we flip the switch, we still have 20 amps flowing through this inductor because the current through an inductor cannot change instantaneously. So if we have 20 amps flowing through this inductor, that means we have 20 amps flowing through this circuit here. And we can analyze this for the moment after the switch flips. We can analyze this the same way we would analyze this if this were a 20 amp current supply flowing down. So, Let's solve for these two unknowns. We have this current IO labeled in this direction and we have VO labeled in this direction. Now one of the challenges here is because our current is 20 amps flowing downward, these uh, IO and VO are sort of labeled in a way that doesn't lend itself well to current flowing downward. So you know what, I'm just gonna change it. I'm just gonna say that instead of 20 amps flowing down, instead of IL is 20 amps flowing down, I'm gonna say we got negative 20 amps flowing up. Can I do that? Yeah, I can do that. Why can I do that? It's still scotch o'clock, folks. So we can do whatever we want. So we got negative 20 amps flowing up. So now this looks more like a circuit that I'm comfortable with. So we got negative 20 amps flowing up. So what's this VO? Well, nah, let's do the IO first. What's this IO? Well, we have a current divider. We have 20 amps and that 20 amps is getting split between here and here. So if we're doing a current divider, What's a 10 in parallel with a 40? 10 in parallel with a 40. That's a, I think it's eight. It's not good to call these things out. It's got to clock, folks. 10, 40. Still got it. Eight. So that's eight ohms. So, so let's do this current divider. So the current divider says that the current through the 40 then the current through the 40 is going to be the total current, which is negative 20 times the um, times 
sorry, times REQ, which is eight, divided by the resistance of the branch, which is 40. Well, you know, come on. Negative four amps. So IO, right after the switch flip, IO is negative four amps. And what about VO? Well, VO, well, we just solved for that current, right? So VO right after the switch flip is gonna be negative four times 40, that's gonna be negative 1600. Ooh. No. Yes. No. Too many. Negative 160 volts. Okay, so right after the switch flips, our IO was negative 4 amps and our VO was negative 160 volts. Fair enough. That's what it is. Now, when I did that current divider, a lot of people say, what's going on here? How come you didn't include that two ohm resistor? So this is in case, in case this, in case this concept wasn't solidified earlier in the class, current divider only applies where the current divides. So the current doesn't divide through that two ohm resistor. We had 20 amps flowing, negative 20 amps flowing into it. We got negative 20 amps flowing out of it. There's no division happening at that two amps. The division only happens once we get to here. So because the division only happens once we get to there, it is the equivalent resistance of those connections of branches that we care about and is the resistance of the particular branch that we care about. So I just wanted to reiterate that. Okay, now we got one more step to do. If we go back here, right? We had solved, so we are up to here. We have solved here. Now we're up to step three, which is solve for the unknown parameters a long, a long time after the switch flips based on the circuit structure. Okay. So a long time after this, let's look at, let me, <laughs> let me clean up my mess over here. What happens on this side of the circuit a long time after the switch is flipped? Well, you'll notice this side of the circuit has no power supplies. There's no current supplies, no voltage supplies. So there was energy stored in that inductor before we flipped the switch. But then after we flip the switch, eh, it's, it's all going to burn up. All that energy that was stored in the inductor is going to be lost across the resistors. And so eventually this circuit's going to, everything's going to die down to zero in this circuit. So eventually it's all going to go just down to zero. It's going to be, another way to think about that is, right, if we have a short circuit here, if we have a short circuit here, this is just a bunch of resistors with nothing to energize them. So if that's a short circuit and we have a bunch of resistors, everything is zero. So I naught as time goes to infinity equals zero. V naught as time goes to infinity equals zero. Now the book treats this as a special case. The book treats this as it's called the natural response. We don't necessarily care about that. All we care about is that right after the switch flip, we had a four after steady state long after the switch flip we had zero here for the voltage right after the switch flip we had negative 160 and then long after the switch flip we had zero so that is all that we care about for now for our analysis it's that just initial final value if the final value is zero well good for us we our math is going to end up being easier a little bit later on so let's do a, a capacitor problem. So for the capacitor problem, the big difference is capacitors are open circuits when time goes to infinity instead of short circuits. And also capacitors, their voltage is what stays the same after the switch flip. So, so let's find one. What's this? What's going on before the switch flip? So when the switch is in this left position, right, and the switch is in this left position, this is the circuit we're looking at. Time goes to infinity. Everything is allowed to stabilize. When time goes to infinity, this capacitor is an open circuit. If this, or sorry, yeah, an open circuit, yeah. If this capacitor is an open circuit, how much current flows? No current flows. If there's no current flow, what's the voltage drop across here? Goose egg, zero volts across the 10K resistor because there's no current flow because the capacitor is an open circuit because we're in steady state. So if there's no voltage drop across that 10 kilo ohm resistor, 
then all 100 volts here by Kirchhoff's voltage law, all of that has to be dropped across our capacitor. So V, what was that called? VC. So VC on the negative side of zero is 100 volts. And that also means in the case of a capacitor, the voltage can change instantaneously. So right after we flip the switch, right after we flip this switch, and our circuit is over here, the voltage across the capacitor is still 100 volts instantaneously after we flip the switch. So if this voltage is still 100 volts after we flip the switch, essentially we're analyzing a circuit that looks like this. So my question is then, what are these IO and VO right after we flip the switch? So right after we flip the switch, where we still have 100 volts across the capacitor, we can find IO and VO. Let's find, let's just find VO first of all here. So to find VO, we're gonna do a voltage divider, but VO is the voltage across both of these resistors in parallel. So we're first gonna combine one over 240 plus one over 60. One. I get 48. So if we had 48 kilo ohms equivalent resistance, we can find VO using voltage divider. So we can say VO is going to equal 100 times 48 divided by 48 plus 32. That's 60. So initially we had 60 volts there. Let's clean this up. So if we had 60 volts across there, what's our I zero? Well, if we had 60 volts, that's also 60 volts across here, which means our I zero is gonna be 60 volts divided by 60 kilo ohms, which is one milliamp. Okay, last step. Time goes to infinity. Time goes to infinity after the switch flipped. Once again, in this circuit, and I promise you we will have an example before we leave with one where everything doesn't go to zero. But once again in this circuit, when time goes to infinity, what are we left with? We have nothing to energize this. So we have a capacitor that started with some energy. It started with 100 volts across it, some stored energy. But all that energy is going to get burned up by these resistors. And when time goes to infinity, there's nothing left on this side of the circuit to keep things energized. So everything's going to die down to zero. So when time goes to whoa, when time goes to infinity, V out. When time goes to infinity, zero, I out. Okay. So we have our our values right after the switch flip. We have our values after the switch flip when time goes to infinity. What's next? Next is the time constant. So, the, so we know right after we flip the switch, we have an initial value, we have a final value. The only question left is how quickly do we transition from one to the other? Time value, the time constant tells us how quickly we transition from one to the other. And the time constant in the case of an inductive circuit is L over R. And in the case of a capacitive circuit, it's RC. So time constant tau, L over R, the question is always R, right? And when we looked at these circuits, we had, we had lots of resistors. So what is R in both the L over R and in the R times C? The R here, and this is very critical. This is, this is right where students make the most mistakes when they're doing these problems. 
The R is the resistance seen by the inductor or the resistance seen by the capacitor. So just like in the case when you did Thevenin and Norton equivalent, in Thevenin and Norton equivalent, we said when we're finding the equivalent resistance, when we're finding the Thevenin equivalent resistance, we'd always say it's the resistance relative to these terminals AB. That's exactly what we're doing here. But, but we're basically plucking out the inductor, plucking out the capacitor, and we're saying that the nodes that the inductor or the capacitor were connected to, those are these nodes AB of our system. The, these are the equivalent nodes that we're trying to find the equivalent resistance between. So we can analyze the resistance seen by the inductor for this L over R or the resistance seen by the capacitor for this R times C. We can analyze this by plucking out the capacitor, plucking out the inductor and treating those connections that it had as to the terminals AB of a circuit and saying, what's the equivalent resistance with respect to the terminals AB? Okay, so let's go back and do that here. So in this circuit, after the switch was flipped open, we had this here and we, are, we had our inductor and the inductor was connected here. So the resistance seen by the inductor is this. So what resistance is this seen by the inductor? Well, the resistance seen by the inductor, we know that this was eight, we already solved for that. So the resistance seen by the inductor is gonna be two plus eight equals 10 ohms. Which means our time constant is L over 10. And L in this case is two Henry's divided by 10. That's equal to oh, 0.2 seconds. Okay, time constant is 0.2 seconds. What does that mean? It means, what this means is that it, effectively what this means is that, is that it takes our circuit 0.2 seconds to get to one minus one over E to the way to our final value. I guess it takes us 0.2 seconds to get to about 67% of our final value. That, I shouldn't have even said that. That doesn't have any meaning right now. You'll see when we get to the mathematical equation a little bit later on. So, but for right now, just know the time constant for this expression is 0.2 seconds. Okay, what about this circuit? What's the resistance seen by this capacitor after the switch flips? Well, the resistance seen by this capacitor after the switch flips is 32K, 240K, 60K. So what is this? This resistance seen by the capacitor is gonna be, we have a, 60K in parallel with a 240K plus 32K. ADK. So the capacitor in this case feels 80 kilo ohms of resistance. So as basically what this is saying is as this capacitor is discharging, it is feeling itself discharging across 80 kilo ohms of resistance. So, so what's the time constant then? The time constant here is R times C. Forty milliseconds. So the time constant for this circuit is forty milliseconds. Okay. Previous circuit time constant was 0.2 seconds, two hundred milliseconds. Next circuit is forty milliseconds. 
Okay, let's put it all together. So the question is now, we found the initial value after the switch flip. We found the final value after the switch flip and we found the time constant. So once again, this is a case where I think the book overcomplicates it. I really think the book, the book sort of says, oh, you have multiple situations and you have multiple, you have this natural response and step response and, and, and they throw out a bunch of equations at you when really all you need is one equation. One equation. And this equation is x of t equals x final plus x initial minus x final times e to the negative t minus t naught divided by tau. Of course, right? This makes obvious sense, right? This is very intuitive. So first of all, why are we, why does this equation have x's? We, this equation has x's because this equation works for a current or a voltage, it doesn't matter. We could be solving for the initial voltage, the final voltage, we could be solving for the initial current, the final current, it doesn't matter. This equation works whether we're looking at a current or a voltage analysis. All that matters is the initial and final values and the time constant. That's why we use x. Instead of v or i, we use x. And xf is the final voltage. So the final current, the final voltage. x naught, or x at time t naught, that is the initial voltage, the initial current. And x final, once again, is that final value. And what is this? E to the minus t minus t naught over tau. This is their way of saying, technically the switch flip doesn't have to happen at time t equals zero. So you could say, oh, the switch flips at, at 50 seconds. So if the switch flips at 50 seconds, then you have to make this 50, right? So you have to say it's t minus 50 divided by tau, and tau is once again the time constant. Okay. So let's, let's use this equation. Let's clean my garbage off this. Let's use this equation to, to apply to these constants we've already found. So going back to this circuit. So this circuit, let's just write our initial final values here really quick. So going back, we had the current was negative four to zero. The voltage was negative 160 to zero. Time constant was uh, 0.2 seconds. Okay. So looking at our equation we have, let's start with the current. We have the final current value, which was, so we have I of T equals, oops, the final current value, which was zero plus I'm trying to use my finger to switch back and forth. Plus, now we have this, the initial minus the final. So our initial was negative four minus zero. That's just, I'll just clean that up and just say negative four. Times e to the negative t minus t zero times e to the minus T minus, now we're saying this, we're saying the switch flips at time zero. So T minus T zero is just E to the negative T divided by the time constant. So divided by 0.2. So if we want to rewrite this, we could say I of T equals negative four E to the negative five T. That's it. That's my equation for the current. And now this is a decaying exponential. That's fine. You, you probably recall decaying exponentials from when you did first order differential equations, when you took differential equations, right? So this is just a first order differential equation where our current dies from, the, it, goes, it goes from starting at negative four at time t equals zero, it dies down to zero as time goes to infinity. And the rate at which it gets there is 0.2. So, okay. Okay, so and again though, right, at time, at time tau, at time t equals 0.2, at time t equals 0.2, this expression equals one, which means this whole expression equals e to the negative one, which means this is equal to one over e, which is about, you know, point, 
what is it point point three seven or so? I don't know. So it's a, it's about it's, right. It's about we're we're about thirty ish thirty some thirty seven ish percent away from our final value. So we are sixty three ish percent towards our final value. So okay, but but the biggest thing is this is our expression. Okay. What about this other one? We went from negative 160 volts to zero. So this is for the voltage across this resistor. Same thing. V of T now equals the final value, which is zero, plus the initial, um, plus the initial value minus the final value, which was the initial value was negative 160 minus zero times e to the negative t over 0.2. So this is negative 160 e to the negative 5t. Now you might say, hold up. Why is this time constant the same for both? Well, sorry. It's the same for both because in all of these circuits, with these, with these first order circuits, everything wiggles at the same rate. Everything dies in the circuit at the same rate. When you switch the switch, all of your voltages and currents everywhere in your circuit on the side with the inductor or capacitor, they all transition at the same rate. All of your currents die or increase at the same rate. All of your voltages die or increase at the same rate. The whole circuit dies or increases at this time constant, which is dictated by the rate at which this inductor loses its energy, the rate at which the inductor charges or gains its energy, charges or discharges, depending on how it's structured. All right, let's do the other example. So here, let's do this analysis here. So uh, let's go back and find our values here. We had, uh, let's see, 60 and one milliamp and then zero. Our, our time constant was 40 milliseconds. Okay, so let's write our equation now. Now we have, let's do our equation for the voltage. So it's gonna be V of X is equal to the final voltage plus the initial voltage minus the final voltage times e to the minus t minus t naught divided by tau. So we can say V of t is equal to the final voltage, which is zero, minus the initial voltage minus the final voltage, which is 60 volts minus zero, times e to the minus t. Once again, t flips at zero, so it's e to the minus t minus t naught is just t divided by tau, which is divided by 0 0.04. Rewriting this, we have uh, sorry, was it? Sorry. Rewriting this, we have 60 e to the minus, so that's going to be uh, 25, right? e to the minus 25 t. Done, volts, right? That's our equation. So our equation, our voltage here starts at 60, it decays to zero, it decays at a rate of, the time constant is 40 milliseconds here. And again, that means that at t is equal to 40 milliseconds, this expression is oh, e to the negative one, which is one over e, which is you know about 37%-ish. So same thing for current, I of t, equals zero plus one milliamp minus zero e to the negative 25t equals boom, that's it. So this is a one milliamp current that decays down to zero at a rate of time constant of 40 milliseconds. 
Let's do a slightly more complicated circuit, but not that much more complicated. Let's just give us something where we decay down to something other than zero. So this would be called the step response in the book, but for us, we don't really care. We just, it's just transitioning to different values, something other than zero. So we're gonna analyze this the same way we did the previous circuit. So before we flip the switch, before we flip the switch, the switch was in this orientation. So before we flipped the switch, we had, this was a short, right, in steady state. So that meant we had all eight amps flowing through here. So before we flipped the switch, I was equal to negative eight amps as labeled. And before we flipped the switch, V was zero, right? Yeah, before, we, well, we don't care about the V before we flip the switch because that could change. The voltage across an inductor can change instantaneously after we flip the switch, that's fine. What can't change instantaneously is that current. So the biggest thing we want to find is that current through the inductor, which we did. We found the current was negative eight amps as labeled. <clears throat> so then after we flip the switch, after we flip the switch, what do we know? We know we still have negative eight amps flowing through here. So, so for right now, I get it. I is equal to negative eight amps, but for my benefit, I'm just gonna label this sucker going this way. I'm gonna say we got eight amps flowing this way. Just, just, to, save, just to save my sanity here. Um, so we got eight amps flowing that way. I is equal to negative eight amps. And that is still the same after we flip the switch. After we flip that switch, that is still the same. That instant after we flip the switch, still got eight amps flowing through there. And so what do we know then, right after we flip the switch? We know that we've got eight amps flowing through here, which means we know that we've got eight amps flowing through here, which means what's this voltage across this resistor? It's gonna be eight times two, it's gonna be 16 volts. So we got 16, so right after we flip the switch, we got 16 volts across this resistor. So my question is, right after we flip the switch, we know right after we flip the switch, I is equal to negative eight. What's V? Well, right after we flip the switch, V, which is the voltage across the inductor, which can change instantaneously, we can find that using Kirchhoff's voltage law. We know we had 24 volts here, and we know we had 16 volts here, which meant V, by Kirchhoff's voltage law, V had to equal 24 volts plus 16 volts, which equals... 40 volts. Okay. Now, let's do time equals infinity. Let's, let's, after the switch is flipped, again, after this, we're ignoring all of this now. After the switch is flipped, these two sides of the circuit are isolated. All we care about is this side. Let's go to time is equal to infinity. So we're going to go on a journey on this side of the circuit where time is infinite. And what happens when time is infinite? When time is infinite, this is a short circuit. So when time is infinite, and this is a short circuit, what's V? Well, V definitely goes to zero. How do we know that? Well, V is the voltage across a short circuit now. So of course V goes to zero. But what about I? I doesn't necessarily go to zero. I, in this case, I is going to be what? After time infinity, we have a 20 volt supply and a two ohm resistor, and this is a short. So I at infinity is going to be 24 volts divided by two ohms. That's 12 amps. So I then, right after we flip the switch, it was negative eight amps. But after time is equal to infinity, it's going to be, after it hits steady state, it's 12 amps. So instead of transitioning from zero to something or something to zero, the current in this case is transitioning from negative eight to 12. So let's see what that equation looks like. Let's see what this equation is gonna look like. Let's go back to our, our master equation here. So our current as a function of time now is gonna be the final value, which is 12 amps, plus the initial minus the final, so it's gonna be, plus, 
So the initial was negative eight minus the final, which is 12. Times, e oh, I didn't find the time constant yet. Oh man, I did not find the time constant. Okay, so what's the time constant? Well, if you're this inductor, what resistance do you see? Keep in mind, if you're this inductor, again, we're doing it just like we had a uh, no, just like we were doing the Thevenin Norton equivalent, which means uh, voltage supplies are short circuits, current supplies are open circuits. So if this voltage supply is a short circuit and we are this inductor, we see two ohms. So what's our time constant? Tau equals, that's right, L over R, 200 milliamps divided by two. That's gonna be 100 milliamps. Okay, so uh, 12 amps plus negative eight minus 12, E to the negative T minus T naught, but eh, again, switch is happening to zero. So T minus T naught is just negative T divided by the time constant, which is, oh, oh, 100 milliseconds. So it's gonna be 0.1. So rewriting this, we have 12 plus negative 20 E to the negative 10 T. It's that simple. It's that simple. We find the initial value, we find the final value, we find the time constant, we plug them into our one equation. And then all of these multiple pages of complexity in chapter seven just melt away. It's all about just the initial value, the final value, the time constant. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. All right, so what about the voltage? Same thing for the voltage, let's do the voltage equation. So the voltage equation is gonna be the final value Final value zero plus uh, plus the initial value minus the final value. So the initial value is 40 minus zero and then times E. So then again, we just have, we still have this E to the negative 10 T. Rewriting this, we have V of T is equal to 40 e to the negative 10 t and we are done voltage and current equations first order rl rc circuit that's all we got to do so the homework will have a couple examples you'll get to try different practice things i'm deliberately trying to simplify this process for you hopefully it's hopefully you know if, you, if you're if you're, if I went too fast, or if I was confusing, go ahead and read the book. But the book spends a lot of time talking about something that I just made very quick and very simple. So, and on that note, this is the last lecture we have for EE 111. And if you're watching this on the video series, this has probably been a fairly weird quarter. And I just want to mention something that one, it's been a very busy quarter for me. It's been a very tough quarter for me. It's been a, it's been a well-deserved scotch o'clock, which I'm sure it's been for you too. And I want to just be honest with you about the way this quarter has gone. So one thing that I have learned over this quarter, or in general, the one thing I've learned about online instruction is it's not that great. It's not that great in the sense, and I say that it's not that great. It might be great for some people, it wouldn't have been good for me. So when I took this class, oh, so many years ago, let's say it was eight years ago. It was, let's say it was eight, let's say it was eight years. I'm a young, I'm a young, bald man. <laughs> I'm a 26 year old bald guy, let's just say that. So um, when I took this class oh so long ago, I know what I needed to learn. What I needed to learn when I took this class is I needed, structure. I needed something that got me out of bed in the morning and forced me to read the book and forced me to attend class and forced me to learn the material. That was something I needed. The other thing that I needed when I learned this stuff is I needed examples. I needed, um, I needed somebody to show me the same process 10 different times in 10 different ways with 10 different examples. And that's what I needed to learn. So I learned best by example. 
and I learned best with structure that 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 gave me that sort of forced me to keep up that forced me to look through the materials if if I were going back and doing this class right now the way we're sort of forced to teach it through this online approach I'm not sure I would have passed this class and so I say that in, and I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be honest with you. I'm not trying to be self-deprecating. I'm just trying to be honest. And I'm trying to be honest in a way that conveys that if you took this class and you're now finished with this class and you're feeling like, I just don't get this. Like, I just don't understand this. I still, it's been nine or 10 weeks and it's, it's not clicking. I don't get it. I feel like this isn't right for me. If you feel that, I don't want you to think that that means that this is not right for you. I think anybody who's in this class right now, anybody who's taking this class, anybody who's watching this YouTube video and they've watched through this whole sequence of YouTube videos, this, you can do this material. You're capable of doing this material. If this quarter sucked, and I totally believe it could suck for some of you, if this quarter just didn't work for you, I totally understand why it wouldn't just work for you. Because honestly, it probably wouldn't work for me. And it, it troubles me a little bit when I think that, so I now have, my undergraduate degree was in computer engineering, but I now have a PhD in electrical engineering. And I worry that if I had been in your shoes taking this class, I would have had a bad experience and I would have thought this isn't right for me and I need to go a different direction with my life. And I worry, you know, I mean, it's been very good. Electrical engineering has been very good to me. It's been very good. I've had a very good life. I've had a very good career. It's been something I enjoy. It's been something that I'm good at. But I'm not sure I would have noticed that if I took this class the way that all of you are taking this if you're watching this video. And so I want you to really understand that, that if this, that if this wasn't right for you, if it, wasn't, if it didn't work for you, that doesn't mean that electrical engineering isn't good for you. And it doesn't mean that you're not good for electrical engineering. It means that this method of content delivery wasn't great for you. It means that this method of taking of learning of this method of education, this method of this way of structuring college education didn't work for you. And, and if that didn't work for you, I completely understand. I'm, I'm completely the exact same way. And so I don't want people to be disheartened. I don't want people to assume too much. What I do want people to try to focus on, no matter how this class went, no matter how this material went, what I really want you to focus on is learn something about yourself. Learn something about how you learn. Learn something about what you need because that is going to be something that you carry with you for forever. No matter what degree you do, no matter how you learn, no matter what mode of delivery you have in the classes you take, knowing what you need to learn is really important. Because even to this day, the things that I learned about how I, what I need to learn when I was in college, I still use them. If I need to learn something new right now, my first step is give me examples. If I'm programming a new type of microcontroller, the first thing I do is I say, I want to find 10 examples of people who developed something for this microcontroller and I just want to read it. I just want to read it because I learn by example and I know that. And I don't necessarily learn by reading through a textbook. I don't necessarily learn by having somebody explain the theory to me. I mostly learn best by, by example. And I also mostly learn best when there is some rigid threshold that says you got to have this done by this timeline and if you don't there's going to be consequences or something and that's also something that might not be quite there for for everybody and so so keep that in mind keep in mind that if you're here if you're watching this video electrical engineering is right for you you can do all of this maybe this quarter didn't work so well Maybe if you go through the material again, it'll work better. Maybe if it's delivered in a different way, it'll work better. But all of you are capable of understanding this. All of you are capable of being good at this. All of you are capable, capable of being excellent at this. And I want everybody to just know that it's unfortunate, this type of structure we have. And it's not just unfortunate on your end, it's unfortunate on my end, because one of the things that I need to teach, one of the things that I need to be a good teacher is I need to remember what it's like to be a good student. And when I say that, I mean, the further I get away from when I learned this stuff for the first time, the worse I get at teaching. In the sense that I forget 
what I didn't know. I forget what confused me. I forget what didn't make sense. I forget what didn't, what wasn't explained correctly the first time around. And when I teach this class with students, they're live in the classroom. I can look at their faces and I can see as I'm explaining something when they sort of all sort of go like that. I can say, oh yeah, I'm explaining this in a way that only makes sense to me because I learned a bunch of stuff that took place after this. So I'm allowed to, I'm able to step back and I'm able to say, okay, let's think about this a different way. Or when I teach this in front of a live class, I can hear students say, wait, why did you do that? Right as I'm teaching it, they'll say, why'd you do that that way? And I'll say, oh yeah, the way I explained it wasn't super clear. So let me go back and explain it a different way. And that's not there for me as I teach this class in this structure. And, and because that's not there for me, I do not as good of a job teaching this class. And definitely that probably means that, that it's not as useful for you to learn the material. And so we're both kind of disadvantaged. And I just, I, I mainly just don't want people to draw too many conclusions about themselves or about me or about this course or about this degree from this one class, the way this content was delivered in this one way. Because it's weird for all of us. It's, it's not ideal for all of us. Well, maybe some of you like it, but I think for the most part, it's not ideal. And I've been very impressed by all the students in this class. I've been really impressed by how well students have done, even students who struggle, even students who haven't done well on the midterms. I've been very impressed by how well students have stuck with it, how well they've tried, how well they have struggled, which is really the key to this class, how well um, students have have contended with some of the difficult concepts in this class and worked their way through them. I've seen big improvements in a lot of students. And I just wanted to leave you with that, that, that um, you know, it's weird. It's weird for all of us, but I can tell that you're all great students. I can tell you're all capable of doing all this. And maybe I'm, maybe I'm too many scotches in the scotch o'clock, but, but I appreciate all of you and it has been a great quarter. And who knows, maybe I'll see some of you again. Maybe some of you will take this class again in the summer. If you do, I'll get to see you all again. You'll get to watch these videos again and we'll probably have a smaller class and we'll get a little more one-on-one -on -one time. Um, but I definitely hope to see all of you at the very least. I hope to see you all in person. And I thank you very much for taking this class. And it has been, um, it has been rewarding for me it has, but it has been very challenging for me and I'm sure you're all on the same boat. So I will see you all on the other side.